Okay, so, so good morning for those who, who are just um, joining us now. Today we are talking about um, pre-action disclosure of documents and I am Carly Forrest, I'm a partner and solicitor advocate in the insurance and risk team here at Brodie's and today I am joined by a very talented cast of Gemma Nicholson, um, senior associate who is also in insurance and risk. We have Rachel Lawson, um, one of the associates who specialises in information and IP law. Um, and Rachel deals with data sharing arrangements, both day-to-day -day compliance and also more complicated um, data sharing arrangements. And we also have Jamie Rickey, senior associate and solicitor advocate within our litigation practice. And Jamie is an experienced litigator dealing principally with commercial disputes. So um, what are we talking about today? Well, pre-action disclosure of documents. And this is something that certainly Gemma and I have seen a lot of um, coming in from clients asking us for advice. So today, for the purpose of today, it's really looking at what can, should I do when you receive requests for documents and for information, but perhaps more importantly, what should you not do to make sure you are also protecting your position? And we're going to look at that in, in more detail today. Um, so with that, I am going to pass over to you, Rachel, to, to kick things off. Thanks, Carly. Um, so I will now be speaking about data subject access requests and what they are before giving an overview of the key considerations when it comes to responding to requests. So firstly, the right of access to information comes from the UK GDPR, which states that individuals can ask organisations that process their personal data within the UK for access to that personal data. However, what does that mean in practice? Well, it's important to note that the right is only exercisable in respect of information about living individuals who can be identified within that information. Information about deceased persons is not caught by the UK data protection legislation, nor is truly anonymised information within scope. Truly anonymised information means that it's no longer capable of being linked to an identified individual and so is no longer personal data. Another point to note is that the right of access is a right to information and not specifically documents. In practice, it may be easier to provide requesters with copies of original documents, um, sometimes with redactions applied to remove any information that is about them, but you're not obliged to do so. Another um, key point to note is that a requester is only entitled to ask you for a copy of their own information. The right of access cannot be used to obtain information about third parties. Of course, sometimes information contains information on multiple persons at the same time, for example, witness statements or information that is more commercial in nature, for example, information within accident and other reports, such as equipment details and investigation outcomes. And we will discuss those in more detail shortly. But the main principle is that a requester can only request access to their own information. Um, I've also just mentioned redactions and again this is often a way that in practice information is provided where redactions are used to remove any information that is not about the requester, either where that information is about other people as I say or other um, commercial type information. Um, one of the last key key points just around what data um, subject access requests are is that even um, when you have identified all of the personal data that you process about the specific requester, it is not necessarily all disclosable. Um, this is because the legislation provides for a number of exemptions, which, if applicable, allow the organisation to refuse to provide the requested information. Gemma will go on to speak more about what kind of exemptions are available later. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so now we know what the right of access is, um, how do we recognise a request? Well, the first point to note is that requests can be made in any form, um, including verbally and even via social media channels. There is also no requirement to reference UK GDPR, and so there is definitely a value in making sure that all your colleagues within your organisation with any form of public facing role are able to recognise a request so that can be, it can be dealt promptly um, by the appropriate team. 
Um, and one of the other key features of a request is that it must purport to ask for the requester's own information. Requests, particularly in the context of accidents, may try to ask for a range of information to assist the requester solicitor assess prospects of success, but while other sorts of information and documents may be disclosable further on in the claims process, it is important to treat a data subject access request as a request at this stage solely under the data protection legislation. So, for example, looking to the example given on the slide, um, all of the information provided um, at points one to five are potentially within scope and could be about the requester. But for example, if they also asked for something like a wet weather policy um, or other type of organisational document, that wouldn't necessarily be within scope at this point when you're treating um, the request purely under the data protection legislation. So going on to the, the next slide um, and going on to these into these concepts in more detail, as I said before, there is no prescribed form for requests. As long as the requester is asking for their own personal data, then the request should be treated as a valid one. But what if a request is received from someone outside of your organisation? What if the request comes from a solicitor? Well, depending on how the request has been received, you may wish to verify that the third party has the necessary authority to act on behalf of that requester. Requests from regulated solicitors may require less additional verification than the scenario where, for example, a husband purports to make a request on behalf of his wife. Um, and so where you do receive a request from a solicitor, however, it's still important to think about whether the information contained within the request matches any information you have in your system about that individual. And it's also important to think about whether the request is being accompanied by evidence of the solicitor's authority to act, for example, through a signed mandate. If you do think it necessary to make any further checks on the identity of the requester, helpfully the time period for responding to the request does pause. Um, and so while the ICO asks that, that you don't make unnecessary requests, so for example, if um, the requester is someone within your own organisation and you're, you know, they, they make a request via their corporate email address, um, there's obviously less checks that you would need to do to make sure that that the, the, the person on the other side of that email address is actually the real requester. Whereas if it comes from a third party, you may wish to, to undertake some further checks just to make sure that the person um, who the request is purporting to be about is actually behind the request. So moving on, um, we've set out here the different stages that you might go through um, to respond to a request. Now, the overarching principle is that organisations have one month to respond. So if a request was received today on the 21st of June, you would have until the 21st of July. If that was a weekend or a public holiday, you would have until the next working day to respond. Now, the theme of this webinar is around pre-action disclosure of documents in the context of claims. And so, although it is increasingly common for pursuers' agents to send a DSAR before intimating a formal claim, you must not wait for a formal claim to be intimated before responding to the request for access to information. A DSAR is something separate to any claim or court process that may follow. And therefore, if you receive a request, you must treat it properly and look to the data protection legislation for how to respond. I mentioned earlier that you can pause the one month timescale to respond where you need to take some further steps to, to verify the identity of the requester. Um, however, you can also pause the timescale if you need to clarify the requester of what it is they're looking for. In the context of pre-action DSARs, it is likely that, re that requests will be fairly clear on what kinds of information the requester is looking for. But if it's a blanket request for all personal data held by your organization, that may be when you ask for some clarity, particularly where you process a high volume of data. Um, there is also a possibility to extend the deadline for responding to the DSAR by a further two calendar months where the request is complex. Um, and whether a re particular response is complex will differ on a case by case basis and is not necessarily tied just to volume. A DSAR could be classified as complex, for example, if there are particular technical difficulties in retrieving information or where you need to apply a number of exemptions. In terms of refusing DSARs, um, organisations can only outright refuse to comply if a request is manifestly unfounded or manifestly excessive. 
Motive or rationale is unlikely to meet this requirement on its own. Rather, you will need some evidence that the requester isn't actually intending on exercising their rights of access or that the request is malicious and is only being sent to cause disruption or that the requester has sent multiple and overlapping requests for information. It's a fairly high bar to prove a request is manifestly unfounded or manifestly excessive. And so in practice, we don't see tend to see too many um, requests refused on this basis. Um, so if, if, if you do think that, that you do have a request that, that meets that bar, um, that could be something um, that we could advise you on specifically. Um, so above all, um, although I've mentioned the deadlines for responding to a DSAR, um, open, requester, open communication with the requester um, and their agent is key, um, where you can demonstrate that you're actively engaging with the request and doing everything you can to respond substantively to it. A, respond, a delay in responding may be more acceptable than where there is no engagement. So moving on to the next slide, um, what are the main takeaways from this part of the session on DSARS? Well, firstly, um, make sure that full searches are conducted on all systems where personal data relating to the requester may be held. The searches you conduct should be reasonable and proportionate, but the ICO does place a high importance on the right of access, and so the burden would be on you to prove that any requested search is unreasonable or disproportionate. Secondly, the information that comes back from the searches needs to be analysed. Only personal data relating to the requester needs to be disclosed, and at this stage it is often useful to refer back to the original request to make sure you're keeping within that scope. At this stage, you also want to be thinking about exemptions, but remember if, that if something is requested but not disclosable under the DSAR process, it may be disclosable later on under that court process. Um, then the last stage to, is to provide the requested information to the data subject. Um, if the requester has asked for the information to be provided in a particular form, um, you should try as far as possible to do that. Um, if you're sending a response by email, it's important to think about whether you can add any passwords or encrypt the data in some way. And if you're sending a response by post, adding in extra measures like recorded delivery can be useful to make sure that the response isn't intercepted or inadvertently sent to the wrong recipient. Um, we wouldn't want to um, commit a, a data breach in response to um, a DSAR. So I will now pass over to Gemma, who will speak more about the types of information you may get asked for as part of a pre-claim request and how to deal with specific documents. Thanks, Rachel. I'm just moving on to the next slide promptly. So the first part of today's session has considered what personal data is, it's thought about access rights and what limits apply to those rights, and the general mechanics of recognising and responding to data subject access requests, or DSARs as we call them. Rachel has provided that insight as a recognised technology data and IP solicitor, but the slant which myself and Coralie offer to this session is that we are liability claims defence lawyers and DSARs feature in the work that we do because often they proceed or dovetail with the making of a third party claim for compensation. So in practice, they're often used by personal injury solicitors to try to bolster their evidence bundle. So to help them decide whether a prospective claim has merit or to strengthen a claim they have already advanced. So at that point, you can then potentially have two overlapping legal processes and it's really important to make sure that you're complying with one, so with the DSAR, that you're not capitulating on the other, that is on the claim made or likely to be made. So if you move on to the next slide, please, if we do restrict ourselves now to thinking about the terms of a DSAR, which you might receive from a person who's been injured or their solicitor, then the request made is often in standard terms. And actually, Rachel flagged as, uh, an example on one of her previous slides, but I've set out below the typical requests which we do tend to see within the table. And when approaching each request, it's really important to go back to remembering what personal data is. So as a starting point, you have to remember that when there's been an incident, the injured person's personal data is data which relates to A, the fact of the incident having occurred, and B, the circumstances of it. So it relates to what the injured person did and also to what someone else might have said or done to them, but it doesn't extend beyond that. 
so it does not extend to witness details, to equipment details, or to investigation outcomes. And it's also important, as Rachel said, to remember that the right of access held is to data, it's not to documents. So documents can be redacted or personal information extracted before disclosure occurs. So turning now to the request that we do tend to see and that you might see come up on your desk, and I've set out some very practical advice on the slides on how you could respond to each of those if need. So firstly, when I refer to accident reports, I'm thinking of the one page accident book entry, which employers are required by law to complete. The book must include the name of the injured person, the date and time of the incident, the place where it happened, a description of what happened and a statement of the person's injury. And it should be completed by the injured person or sometimes someone on their behalf. Now the information within that document is likely to be personal data and to fall within the scope of the DSAR. If it's been completed by other than the injured person, the name of the drafter should however be redacted. Where a statement has been taken from the injured person post incident, to confirm what happened. Again, the detail within that statement is likely to be personal data and to fall within the DSAR, but the name of the drafter or the interviewer should be redacted. As to the witness statements of others, and this is a bit of a trickier one, so it's important to ascertain whether the witness who provided the statement has provided consent for it to be disclosed. And you also have to consider whether any exemptions apply such as for third party data. So it's possible the statement contains the personal data of the person who provided it. If that's correct and you don't have consent, the best approach may be to disclose only extracts from the statement, to include only those statements which relate to the injured person and what they said or did. If the statement was very clearly prepared in contemplation of litigation, so because you think you're going to get a claim, it can be withheld on the grounds of legal professional privilege. For CCTV footage, the injured person is entitled to the footage they feature in. If others are shown and can be identified, then you do need to think about their personal data too. So if you have concerns, you could consider pixelation or extracting stills if appropriate redactions applied. And when asked for CCTV footage, it is really important to remember that you do need to be able to identify the injured person, so make sure that you do have a look at it. It's also likely to be possible to agree with the person making the request that the time frame which the footage covers can be limited to when the incident occurred. As Rachel touched upon earlier, so policies of the business, things like gritting policies, things like safe systems of work or risk assessment, they are not personal data and they're not recoverable under the DSAR to any information which relates to any root cause analysis prepared post-incident or to any remedial measures implemented. Any attempt to recover those types of documents via a DSAR could be resisted. Now the final category of document which I'm going to mention today is the internal investigation report. The first thing to do is to consider why you prepared that document. If it was prepared in contemplation of litigation, and it's privileged and it should not be disclosed. If it was prepared as a matter of routine to learn from the incident, then it may not be privileged, but only certain aspects of it will be the injured person's personal data. So those parts relating to what they did or said can be extracted, but the entire document should not be disclosed. To do so runs the real risk that you might prejudice the defence of any third party claim made now or in the future. So the key takeaway from today is really just the importance of adopting a measured and informed approach responding to a DSAR. Why? Well, because not doing so might lead you not only to infringing the data protection rights of a requester or others, but to prejudicing the ability to defend a third party claim, and in some cases, disrupting whether that claim is covered by insurers. So it's really so important to take your time and to get it right. And to help make sure you do get it right, you need to be mindful of the response timescales and crucially to properly analyse the request against the knowledge of what personal data is, 
what the requester is entitled to and the limiting factors which are available to you. So from thinking about what documents you might need to hand over, we're going to turn now to think about what documents you might be able to take from someone else. And with that, I'll pass you over to one of our solicitor advocates, Jamie Leakey. Thanks, Gemma. So in Scotland, the courts have a really wide power to order the inspection, uh, photography or preservation of documents and other property uh, about which questions might arise in future court proceedings or court proceedings that are currently ongoing. As I say, it's a really wide power and it can let us do some really exciting things like don raids to recover computers, um, literally going first thing in the morning with uh, the heavies to uh, inspect premises and to recover everything that they can get their hands on. But more commonly, uh, we use this power to recover documents ahead of uh, future court actions. Now, the power is contained in Section 1 of the Administration of Justice Scotland Act 1972, and so we commonly refer to Section 1 applications and Section 1 orders. So we can move on to the next slide. The applications can be made either to a local sheriff court or to the highest civil court, the Court of Session. And I'll discuss procedure in a moment, but it's worth noting at the outset that this is a peculiarly Scottish power. The Act it only extends to Scotland, it doesn't extend to England and Wales. But what does that mean in practice? Uh, can someone out with Scotland be compelled to produce documents if the future proceedings are going to be brought in Scotland? Well, the answer to that is no. Uh, we have some binding authority from our highest civil court uh, that tells us uh, that that can't be done. And that was in a case where owners of a B&B &B, uh, wanted to get uh, documents and uh, information from TripAdvisor so that they could um, start suing guests who had left what they thought were defamatory reviews. But because TripAdvisor were uh, located in the States, the court said that it didn't have any jurisdiction. Applications can be made by anyone who's likely to be party to the future action or who is likely to be brought into the future action. So that means potential claimants, it means potential defenders, it also means potential formal, uh, formal third parties. Uh, so it may not be a case that is being raised uh, by you or against you, it may be a case that you have to intervene in, uh, for uh, for example, uh, as an insurer. So some recent examples I've been involved in, um, one was for an insurer who intended to raise subrogated proceedings regarding an electrical fire, and they wanted to recover the electrical maintenance records from the building's owners. And another one was for uh, Section 151 Road Traffic Act uh, insurers who were likely to minute into proceedings against their insured relating to a fatal accident, and they wanted to recover uh, the police evidence in relation to the accident. So in the first example, the documents were really helpful to help make the written case more specific and to bolster uh, the evidence available. In the second case, the documents were used to help prepare uh, the defence on liability in advance of proceedings actually being served. So. Uh, different uses and multiple uh, different opportunities that are uh, available uh, using this power. And if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, when can the Act be used? Well, there are three main requirements. That the proceedings are either in existence or are likely to be brought. That there is, on the face of it, an intelligible and stateable case for the proceedings that are going to be brought. And uh, thirdly, that questions will arise about the documents sought in those proceedings. And the first and third requirements come directly from the Act, and the second one has developed through case law. And the purpose of that second requirement really is to prevent someone fishing for a document they don't know exists. So in Scotland, in court actions, we don't have a disclosure procedure like in England and Wales, where um, everything that's relevant has to be uh, produced early on in a case. Uh, here, you can only recover documents that you can demonstrate exist and can show uh, are relevant to the case. And so those considerations have come into play in Section 1 applications as well. So not enough to show that a document exists, but it must also be shown that there are reasonable grounds for the action that's going to be raised. Um, as well as my commercial litigation practice, I have uh, quite a busy contentious trust in the state's practice, and we see this quite regularly where families want to challenge wills. We can say the will exists, but we don't actually have anything to suggest that there is grounds to uh, challenge the will. Um, so, although we know the document exists and we know that if proceedings were raised, that document would be relevant, there's no uh, statable case for the uh, action being raised. And so, uh, 
the documents unrecoverable under section one. And we'll go to the next slide to discuss procedure. I'm going to talk about sheriff court procedure. Uh, for most non urgent applications, that's usually where we'd raise it. Um, court session procedure is pretty similar anyway. Uh, and I'm only going to talk about uh, non urgent orders for recovering documents from a third party uh, for uh, the more exciting Don Raid type application. Uh, it's a little bit different. Those applications are. Um, relevant where there might be a risk that documents or property are going to be destroyed. Um, if the person who gets them, um, who holds them, gets advance notice of the uh, application. So more common where uh, the party who holds the documents is going to be the defending party in the future proceedings because they might have uh, some interest in getting rid of the documents. Um, happy to discuss uh, that procedure with anyone one-on-one, -on -one, but we'll concentrate on the more uh, conventional type of application for recovery rather than preservation. So we start the process by preparing the court papers. And the main paper is the initial writ, which sets out the legal case. That deals with the sort of things that I've just discussed. So what the documents are, what the case that's going to be brought is all about, what the basis for that case is, and what questions are going to arise around the documents and why they're relevant to those proceedings. But the court rules also tell us that we've got to lodge two further documents. The first one is an undertaking on behalf of the applicant, uh, promising to the court three things. First, that it will comply with any order uh, of the sheriff as to payment of compensation to the person who holds the document, if, it, if the order or execution of the offer causes them any loss. The second is to bring, within a reasonable time of uh, executing the order, the proceedings that are envisaged. And thirdly, to not use the documents for any other purpose uh, other than those proceedings without first getting the permission of the sheriff. Um, the court rules set out the terms in which the undertaking has to be given, so there's not a lot of wiggle room to modify them. If you don't give that undertaking, then you can't proceed with the application. Uh, undertakings in this context are formal promises to the court, and so breaching those uh, could find you in contempt. The other document that we lodge with the initial writ is a sworn affidavit on behalf of the applicant, which supports uh, what we say in the initial writ. Regularly, the affidavit will reflect almost to the word what's in the initial writ. Um, I'll set in the background why the documents are known to exist and the facts that will support the case uh, that's going to be brought later on. The affidavit um, usually takes the longest to prepare out of these documents. It's a little bit easier now that we can um, have those notarised and signed electronically. Some of you may have experience of the um, rather bizarre but um, ultimately easier process of holding documents up to a camera and putting your right hand in the air and uh, swearing an oath to someone on the other side of a computer screen. Uh, that certainly makes things a bit easier to do the uh, notarization part, but the actual drafting, we can usually put it together based on documents and correspondence that we've got, but we may also have to have a sit down call with you to uh, run through the whole story and to take notes and prepare the document on the basis of that. So when they're lodged with the court and assuming everything's in order um, and the court doesn't raise any questions, it will give us the authority to serve the papers on the respondents. And the order granting that authority will also fix the date for the first calling of the case in court, which in these types of actions usually five or six weeks after the papers are lodged. The respondents in the Section 1 action will be the organisations or the people who hold the documents. So it's not necessarily the people who are going to be involved in the future action. And there's if the people who are involved in the future action don't um, hold the documents that you want, there's no reason why you have to bring them into the Section 1 application. We can serve the papers uh, by record delivery or by sending around court officers. Where it's an organisation um, or a business, then usually recorded delivery will work because there's usually someone there to sign for it uh, as long as you send it during the week. So we can usually avoid the cost of having to employ court officers. The holders of the documents will get usually 21 days to tell the court whether they're going to defend the action, whether they want to put in a written notice of defence, and they'll have to lodge that notice of defence uh, within uh, those 21 days. Now, in the good old days when all court hearings were actually in court and we all uh, went to the various different sheriff courts around the country, every Section 1 application would call uh, regardless of whether or not uh, there was a defence lodged. Now that most hearings are online, or certainly most procedural hearings are online, there's a possibility that the sheriff will grant the application on the papers if there's no defence. But more often there will be a hearing, regardless of whether or not there is a defence. Uh, 
if there isn't a defence lodged and there's nothing particularly unusual about the action and there's nothing obviously wrong in law, then more often than not, the sheriff will simply grant it uh, at that hearing without uh, requiring too much persuasion. If there is a defence stated to the action and the respondents uh, want to challenge the application, then the sheriff can still grant the application at that first hearing if it's obvious that the hearing, or if it's obvious that the defence is a nonsense, but more likely uh, a hearing will be fixed uh, for legal argument and possibly uh, witness uh, evidence, but that's usually on uh, be fairly unlikely in this sort of application. It would usually be uh, a hearing on legal arguments. Depending on the busyness of the court, that could be uh, some weeks or even a couple of months after uh, that initial hearing. And assuming the order is granted, uh, it then has to be served on the parties holding the documents. So uh, although you serve the court papers at the start, you then have to also serve the formal court order. There's a procedure for the documents to be voluntarily disclosed, and in the vast majority of cases, that's what happens. If there's no voluntary disclosure, then there's also a process for uh, compelling witnesses to attend to a sort of court hearing that we call a commission and uh, be asked questions about what documents are held. And if we go into the next slide, why would we do this? Why is the procedure helpful? Well, I've already mentioned uh, two ways that the action these applications can be used to help make a case to help bolster your evidence for a case that you're going to bring or to get on the front foot and to be able to prepare your uh, defense um, in your own time and uh, without having to wait for uh, a claim to be brought um, in the uh, road traffic insurer example that i mentioned it was uh, documents from the crown and the police that we're seeking um, usually uh, those uh, documents are confidential and the uh, Crown and the Police won't release them without a court order, but more often than not, they're quite happy to release them when there is a court order. So it can be a really useful uh, tool to get that sort of information. The other um, great benefit of going through this procedure is it can save you on cost. If you um, get the documents that support a case early on and find that actually the case might not be economical to run, then uh, it's better finding that out, having spent a little bit of money on a Section 1 application than finding out um, when you're knee deep in the next court action and it's going to cost a lot of money to get out. Um, it may also um, help um, with costs if you're able to prepare uh, a defence, as I say, in your own time and without the pressures of um, the court proceedings having already been brought. And on that, I'll hand back to Carly for any questions. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you to everyone. I think my question to Jamie is, who are the Brodies heavies? But you probably shouldn't answer that if it's been recorded. <laughs> you can tell me later. I will do. Um, <laughs> so I think we've got a question, um, which is probably one for you, I think, Rachel, um, which is what happens if you, if you don't respond to a DSAR on time? So um, as I um, spoke about earlier, there are timescales that the UK GDPR expects you to adhere to when responding to a DSAR. So in the main, that's one month from date of receipt of the request. And then in some circumstances, you can extend that by two calendar months. Now, the way that the ICO, the UK Data Protection Regulator, works is that they wouldn't proactively pursue an organisation for, for being late, um, you know, off its own back. Um, However, it, it may take action or may be instigated to take action should um, a requester make a complaint, which they are entitled to do so. Um, so in those circumstances, a requester um, may go to the ICO to complain that a request is late, in particularly if they've not received it yet. Um, and, and that may tip the ICO off to think, OK, let's let's take a look, take a look at this in, this organisation. Um, now, in terms of what, what may happen as a result of that, um, in our experience, the ICO was most concerned with organisations that are willfully and negligently not responding to requests. So um, it's unlikely that they would take action um, in response to an organisation for being late where there's been open communication with the requester um, and steps have been taken that you can show that you're actively 
you know, taking steps to actually respond substantively to the request. You may be seeking legal advice on, on what exemptions that you're wanting to um, apply and things like that. Um, and so, yes, there, there are timescales within the legislation and for, for most of the time, the ICO will expect you to adhere to them. But in our experience, if, if you do require extra information, perhaps a request to sat with, uh, with a colleague for a period of time that, that, that wasn't aware of, of, the, of the responsibilities, um, or the re the request is particularly complex. If you can ex if you can explain that and evidence, you know the steps that you have been taking to try um, and meaningfully respond to the request, then the 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 chances of any regulatory action um, are slim. However, you know you, you are required to show that you are taking all all steps that you can do to to respond to the request. So if you are going to be late, um, we do recommend that you you tell the requester or their agent as soon as possible, um, and you do seek to respond um, as soon as you can thereafter. Mm -hmm. So keeping the avenue of communication open is really the best the best way to go about Definitely. it. Definitely. Okay. Um, thank you to, to everyone. I don't think we've got any other questions. So thank you to all of the speakers. It was really interesting. Um, it's come, coming up more and more, as we say. So hopefully that was helpful to everyone who is on today's webinar. Um, any questions, all of our details are here. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone.